you guys got friends? Do you guys have, you guys have friends, right? Yeah, do you have friends? Do you guys have, how many of you have a best friend?
So do you want to take it home and take it back to the other and bring it back to the other? Oh, he is. Oh, oh, well. Hey, no, he had an offer to remember I said that. Can I pray for you guys? Let's pray that you have good friends. Jesus, I thank you that you give us good friends. And I thank you that you give us this wise piece of advice to just stay away from people that are bad influences on us. Help us to know the difference. Help these children to build good, good friendships. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for loving us back. Amen. See you guys. Jesus. So I'm on this uh, obsession with um, the concept of will you do acts that are world changing? Not big world changing because God never called on us to change the world. He only calls on us to change our world. And, and I'm starting to get my little following. And now people are starting to hand me little examples of, hey, here was a world-changing act that I experienced or I did or I was the object of. Let me just share a few of them because the, they landed close to the boat. I don't like that. Did you catch the significance of one of the announcements? 18 high school kids came out to breakfast at 7 a.m. on a frigid Friday morning to hear a Christian message. And, and yes, to get breakfast. There are two world changing stories in that. One, the kids would come out. Two, that there would be a place for them to come and people making food for them. That's a good one. How about this one? Let me give it another one. I've not got five on my list here. I'm only going to give you a couple. Uh, how about this one? State highway patrolman changed a tire on a cold, wintry morning for a, let's call them a nearly elderly couple. I don't know, Ron, who that nearly elderly couple <laughs> is, but maybe sometime you can share that one. Yeah. Yeah, I did see that Ron crossed out the note and said, speak for yourself, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you consider yourself elderly or not even close? <laughs> oh, not even close. <laughs> you know, that, those kinds of acts, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. 2,200 acts in the year 2014 of, of world-changing acts, none of them huge, all of them just changing people's worlds. And so now that, now that I'm getting a following, you're noticing when people do things, and you're noticing opportunities to do. I have a couple to add to the list. Um, so Friday afternoon, I had a meeting at, at 10 after 3, school ends at 3, I had a meeting at 10 after 3 in the principal's office, not one of those, but just in the principal's office. And as I'm walking out my door, here's my, my co-teacher across the hall, Michael. He and his family were going to take off and go to Wisconsin for the weekend. And it is snow and a blizzard in, in Miamisburg, like it was up here on Friday afternoon. And he goes, Greg, is there any way you could cover my afternoon parking lot duty? Now, you know what? Three weeks ago, I'd probably gone, uh, I have a meeting at 10 after 3. But I'm constantly aware now. God is increasing my awareness of can you just have your eyes open for an opportunity to change somebody's life? And I said, absolutely. He goes, I said, I do have a meeting, but I'll, I'll be a couple minutes late. That's what he goes, you're not going to get fired for this, are you? I said, look, if I'm going down in flames, I'm not going down in flames because I'm two minutes late to a meeting. I'm going to do something really bad. And I said, no, it's fine. So they got to leave. I changed their world. I got my attendant head start. That's what I'm talking about. And then yesterday, congratulations to the Covington wrestling team for tearing up the North District. I mean, that was great. Dave and Christian did the same thing in the South District, so we get to meet next weekend at, at the sectional or regional or whatever it's called. It's going to be a great wrestling meet. But I was at the, the uh, I was at West Melbourne High School, and I was there watching my wrestlers wrestle. And when I got there, look, the reality is, in 23 years of teaching, I have now been to four wrestling matches, and three of them have been this year. I don't really get into wrestling, but I have five seniors who are, are just world-class wrestlers, and then the rest of you know, I'm like, and they're five minutes from my house at the district meet. I gotta be there. So I went to the meet, and I walked in, and, and I, I'm looking for the Dane Christian. Oh, there they are. And I sit down amongst them, and I have my Dane Christian shirt on, but they all had Dane Christian wrestling shirts on. And I was the only one in this crowd of moms, dads, grandparents, and girlfriends that had the wrong day Christian shirt on. And, and I was all alone. My wife was up seeing our daughter in Queens. I was sitting by myself in the middle of a crowd. And, and one of the moms noticed. And she said, what size are you? And she handed me.
me a shirt so I can be part of the part of the group. So I, I and now it's really a helpful shirt because it tells the, the weight classes and the names of all the guys on the back and it really helps because I don't understand less and all I know is you're supposed to have the lack the, the other guy screaming for mercy right before the ref slaps the mat. That's all I know about wrestling. But that mom noticed that that I was kind of an outcast among the wrestling uh, culture, and she met that need. That's a world change. That changed my whole life. It just changed that, that eight hours yesterday, or whatever it was. World changing acts. Don't forget, God is not asking you to change the whole world. You're not capable of that. Thank goodness. He doesn't ask us for something we would be incapable of. He just wants us to change our, our world. Look for those acts. Respond if you're the person that's supposed to be the actor, or receive if you're supposed to be the person that's having your world change for a moment. Um, this morning, as we continue to look at world changing, I want to ask you, well, it's kind of a common man question. What is worship? Did, did you guys love the prelude that he played this morning? Who was the composer of that? Is that somebody we know? Haydn, we know the name Haydn. Even people like us know Haydn. Okay, Haydn, that was beautiful. And, and, it, and it ushered us into, I mean, it kind of took all the pressures of outside that's been part of your week and said, now it's time to worship. Okay, so I asked the common man's question. What is worship? What do we do when we're worshiping? What are the acts of worship? Oh. Prayer, singing. Prayer, singing, praises to God, being thankful. I, I mean, we start our service, if you, if you like, read your bullet and not just, you know, go through it. We have a prelude that's supposed to quiet us down. Then we have our call to worship. And then everything that follows. Singing a hymn. Putting it on kids' basic level. That's worship. Confessing our sin. Prayer of confession, assurance of pardon, hearing the choir speak to us and give us a reason for a hallelujah, singing again, opening God's word. This is all worship. And we call it this. I mean, we, we say, Are you going to worship today? Yeah, I'm going to worship. Hey, we had a great time of praise and worship last week. Yeah, we did praise and worship. We know what it is, but we know definitions of things. It's really easy. Like, what is fellowship? Well, in church, in American church, Anything that has coffee and something sweet to eat, that's what we call fellowship. <laughs> Anything that has singing and prayer, that's what we call worship, right? I want to show you something from the world changer, the Apostle Paul, from Romans chapter 12. He has something to say about worship, and it stopped me dead in my tracks in the last two weeks as I was reading this. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 Paul is going to talk to us, and remember, he's a world changer, and so he's going, to, he's going to give us some hints about what being a world changer is and how we should think and what we should do. Romans chapter 12, one of his longer books, here's what he says. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Did you see it right in the middle, right there? Did you see his definition of worship? I mean, he said something, and then he said, this is your spiritual worship. And there wasn't one mention of singing or praying we're studying God's word. And I, I, I realized this a couple of weeks ago as I was studying this passage. I understand what worship is in the modern church. And I like worship. I love it when music just draws me in. I love it when we quiet ourselves and everything that was tumultuous outside in my life is quieted when I come together to worship my God. I love worship. But Paul's got a little different spin on what worship is. And it has nothing to do with singing or praying, or even opening God's word and studying it. He says this right at the end of verse 1. This is your spiritual worship. What is? Well, it comes right before it. Offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. 
Oh, wait a second there, Paul. Um, look, I know that this was written in the first century, and I know what their worship was like in the first century, and you do too. We remember this from the plan of Rock Board. It involved going to the temple and offering sacrifices. If you were a wealthy person when it came time for sacrifice, you brought a bull with you. We're talking about a male cow. I mean, you're dragging this thing in. And you hand the rope to the priest, and he takes it, and ugh. Good thing we got rid of the kids. I mean, it's pretty brutal. We slit the throat of that cow. We pour the blood all over the altar. We cut and dice and slice that cow up. And we arrange those parts on the fire of the altar. And we make a burnt offering to God. That's a sacrifice. If you're not rich enough to afford a bull, then you go for a lamb or you go for a goat. If you're not even wealthy enough for a bull or a goat, then you bring a pigeon or a duck. And if you are really destitute poor, you bring an ephod. But in all cases, sacrifice to God, worship to God was about slitting the throat and putting it on the fire and consuming it. This is to God, and it's consumed in flames. Now Paul does something kind of weird here. You want to know what worship is, verse 1? Offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. That is so oxymoronic, how do you even deal with it? It just bumps heads with it. Because if it's a sacrifice, it's not living. And if it's living, it's not a sacrifice. And he just put those two thoughts together and he goes, here's what worship is. You offer yourselves as living sacrifices. So I ask myself as I study this, how can something be a living sacrifice? What are the similarities of a dead bull or a dead ram or a dead dove or a handful of flour thrown on the fire? What are the similarities from that and me? Well, it's similar. You slice the neck of a cow, you spill his blood, you cut him up into pieces, you put him on the altar. He's completely consumed. He's gone. Ah. Oh. So what Paul is saying here is, you, you want to understand what real worship is? You crawl up there, not on the literal fire. You crawl up on the, the, the sacrifice altar and you say, God, I want to be consumed for you. I want everything about me to be consumed for you. Every thought I have, every word I have, every action I have. I'm, I'm went, and I'm not taking it back because the cow can't go in. I kind of like to put my body back together. You kind of like the kids put the heart back together. I like to put that back together. No, nope, cow can't do that once he's sacrificed. Some of the similarities are it's 100% being sold out. That's worship. That's hard. Isn't it easier just to sing? Isn't it easier just to praise God and share prayer requests and worship God and read his word and study his word and explain his word? Isn't that easier? Yeah, it's a whole lot easier than saying, God, every thought, every word, every action, I am putting myself on the altar and I want to be consumed for you. That's tough worship. And that's what Paul says is, is your spiritual act of worship. Oh, but there's some things that are different between a cow, a, a, a lamb, a goat, an ephah flower, and us. Some things are the same, some things are different. How about this one? Who puts the, who, who brings the cow to be sacrificed? Who brings the sheep, the lamb, the goat, the dove, the pigeon, or the flower? The owner. The cow doesn't get to go, I, I think I'll present myself for worship today. No, the owner of the cow does. But in this one, here's one of the differences. Who puts you on the altar? You do. Cal doesn't put himself on the altar. The lamb doesn't put himself on the altar. His owner does. Who puts you on the altar? You do. Those of you that are parents, and that's most of us, those of you that are parents or grandparents, haven't you gone through that thing where you say, I hope my kids grow up to love Jesus like I've learned to love Jesus? But guess what? You can't put your kids on the altar. You can't put your grandkids on the altar. You train them, you teach them, you pray for them, you encourage them. They have to do that. This is one of the differences that Paul's dealing with here is cows and goats and ephahs of flour. They can't put themselves on the altar. They are put on the altar by their owner. But real worship is when you put yourself on. Some of you are going along and, and, and you can see that I skipped a part. And you're going, wait a minute, Greg. I'm not even sure I'm ready for that spiritual worship thing. That's pretty heavy stuff. But you skipped something. I did skip something. Can we go back to the beginning of verse 1? Because as I looked at this, 
I felt like God was saying, you can't get to that point until you deal with the first part of the verse. Look what it says first. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, oh my goodness, therefore, I taught you years ago, when you see a therefore, you need to stop and ask what it's there for. And the answer to that question is always the chapters that have come before. I don't think we can understand chapter 12. And putting ourselves on the altar as an act of worship until we understand chapters 1 through 11. So there you go, you've got a long-term project. Read Romans 1 through 11 and understand how the argument ascends with, wow, now I get why I would put myself on the altar. But notice what Paul says. He says, therefore, I urge you. You know, Paul was a demanding, demanding spiritual writer. His conversion, his Jesus story is so profound. He, he takes out the gloves and sometimes he throws pretty hard punches. He goes, you guys better cut out that stuff. You better get rid of yourself. He's pretty, he's pretty tough. But this time he doesn't go tough. He urges. He doesn't command. He urges. I entreat you, brothers. I beg you, my friends. But then the next few words, I think, are critical to our understanding. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In view of God's mercy. Can somebody tell me the difference between God's grace and God's mercy? What is grace versus mercy? Are they just synonyms? Can they do that for me? God's grace. Grace is when something is given to you that you don't deserve. You give a present to somebody who's not on your Christmas exchange list. That's an act of grace. Mercy is not being given what you do deserve. It's usually a negative thing that's withheld. Listen to what Paul says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, I have a tough assignment for you. And this is really a tough assignment. I want you to open your eyes to the mercies of God in your life. In your Jesus story, some of you are going to have to go back decades, and it's going to get ugly before it gets happy. And I want you to ask questions like this. If God did not intervene in my life, based on the actions that I chose to do, if God did not step in and give me his mercy, what would I have had to do? Um, I'll give you a list that was just a generic list. I just started brainstorming specific questions about this, things like this. Back in the day when you were in high school or maybe in college, during those foolish years, when you made bad choices because you could only see 24 hours ahead of you, High school kids don't tend to look at long-term consequences. 24 hours ahead, that's all you can see. Don't raise your hand, this is not testimony hour. Did you ever go to a party and get a little bit looped? Did you ever drink too much and then get in the car and get behind the, the steering wheel and drive? Did you ever do that? Did you get pulled over? Did you get a ticket? Did you bring shame to your family? Did you have to do jail time? Did you run your car into a tree? Did you kill somebody in that car wreck? The answer to a lot of those questions are, I did it, but I didn't have to suffer consequence. I didn't get caught. I didn't bring family, shame to my family. My dad never found out. And I wasn't one of those horrible stories that wrapped the car around the tree and killed three of my friends. By God's mercy, that didn't happen to you. Do you ever do this? Again, none of this is going to be testimony now. I don't want to raise hands. Before you were married, did you sleep around with anybody? Did you get an STD from it? Made anybody pregnant? Did you get pregnant? Did you have to deal with that whole, oh my goodness, I just changed my entire life? A lot of people sleep around. A handful get pregnant. A handful get STDs. And so many of us get away with it by God's mercy. Did you ever do this one? This isn't nearly as bad. We can almost raise our hands on this, but don't. You ever work long shifts 
and you're just not getting enough sleep, and you get in the car or you're pushed to vacation, and you just want to save them forty nine dollars at the hotel, so you're gonna drive straight through, and you are you are way too sleepy to be driving, and you didn't get in a car wreck, you didn't run off the road, you didn't maim or kill your family by God's mercy. Just start working down through a list of things that you know you did and you didn't have to pay the price tag for. You ever, you ever really violate a long-term friendship? You just do something that just trashes the friendship and your friend forgets you. You didn't have to endure the pain of destroying forever a lifelong friendship. You ever do one of those? I mean, think through all the things that you have done and you didn't have to pay for it. Why not? By God's mercy. I like the NIV. It's my favorite translation of the, the scriptures in the modern world. But there's another um, translator that I love. His name's J.B. Phillips. He was alive here in World War II. He's British. And he translates, and I love it. Jesus comes post-resurrection, and the, the disciples are out fishing, and they haven't caught anything. And he, and he calls from the shore, and he says, translate that might be, hey, friends, have you caught anything? But J.B. Phillips, British translator, translates it, chaps, haven't you caught anything? And I love that Jesus saying chaps to his disciples. I just love the British translation. Here's how J.B. Phillips translates Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God. I beg you, brothers, as an act of intelligent worship to present him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him, and acceptable by him. So open your eyes wide open to the mercies of God in your Jesus story. Go all the way back to your high school years. Open your eyes to the mercies of God in your eyes. And you know what? Once you come to turn with you, terms of how merciful God has been to you, that he has not given you what you deserve, you're going to want to crawl up on that altar and say, God, I want to be as an act of worship. I, I want every thought to go to you because I have so many wasted years. And every word and every action, I want to be aware of people around me and I want to do what I can do. Even if it's just covering a parking lot duty or changing a tire. I want to be an act of worship to you. In fact, I, I, I would go as strongly as to say this. I don't think it's possible to effectively jump over the contemplation of God's mercy in your life and ever get to a point where you can truly worship God with your life. If you haven't processed through how amazingly merciful God has been for you, I think you'll always have an excuse not to climb up on that altar. Because you haven't opened your eyes to the mercies of God. But once you do, mm, God will rock your world with his mercy and his grace. And you'll have a really hard time not rocking other people's worlds with mercy and grace because of what God has done for you. That, my friends, is the advice of the world changer, the Apostle Paul, Romans 12. May God add his blessing to the reading and the explanation of this word.